apologize. My green screen doesn't seem to want to work. Any, my background picture just appears on my face and it doesn't appear on the screen. So we'll just have to go with the plain old green back, back there. So uh, welcome to What's Up Over Edmonton for the month of April 2020. My name is Jeff Robertson. I'm a member of the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Edmonton Centre. And with me is Alistair Ling, also a member of Edmonton Centre. Um, we call, oh, I, I will start my PowerPoint now here. So uh, we call this uh, What's Up Over Edmonton because um, our skies are uh, quite a bit different than what uh, is presented in a lot of the popular astronomy uh, publications like Sky News or Astronomy or Sky and Telescope, which are uh, more, uh, more, talk about more of the sky in uh, the mid-latitudes mid of North America. For example, uh, this is the uh, sky over Toronto on July the 5th at 11 o'clock. And I always point out this constellation here, which is Scorpio, uh, because if you were in Toronto, you'd be able to see the whole thing. But uh, in Edmonton uh, on July 5th, 11 o'clock, or any time in, uh, in Edmonton, this is about all you're ever going to see a Scorpio. The uh, constellation never rises above, uh, completely rises above the horizon. Most of the uh, information I use uh, comes out of the Observer's Handbook, which is put out by the uh, RESC every year. It is 352 pages of more information than uh, you could possibly use uh, for the uh, amateur astronomer or even at the professional uh, for observing uh, the uh, sky. So what have we got in April? And I've, my little note here is don't take off the snow tires just yet because traditionally uh, we get more snow in April in terms of quantity than we do in any other month. So we've got the best view of Mercury this year in the evening sky or yes, evening sky. Uh, we've got a parade of planets very low uh, in the pre-dawn sky. We have a meteor shower, the Lyrid meteor shower. And if you have a telescope, we have galaxies galore, uh, particularly around the constellation Virgo or between the constellations Leo and Virgo. There is just a ton of uh, galaxies to see. Uh, sunrise this morning was at uh, 6.54 a.m. It will set today at 8.18. And astronomical twilight ends, that is when it is well and truly dark, at 10.29. On the 30th of April, the sun will rise at 6 o'clock, almost a full hour than, uh, from what it is uh, right now. It will set at 9.02. And uh, astronomical twilight starts at 1149. Uh, so just before midnight when it gets well and truly dark. And this is the last month um, where it will get well and truly dark throughout the entire month because in May uh, we enter a period of perpetual twilight where the sky never gets completely dark. So uh, this is the planetarium portion of this program. Um, uh, as always, I have pre-recorded it, and because I was getting a very nasty hum when I was recording these things through this uh, uh, headpiece that I'm wearing right now, I went and bought a better microphone, which doesn't hum, but it seems to be more than the program I used to record this, which is Fraps, and so my voice is going to slow down and speed up throughout the recording. Uh, so I do apologize for that. I will look into seeing if I can uh, uh, fix that for next month. So here we go. Start the uh, planetarium portion. And uh, I've got to set it at uh, 8.15 uh, tonight, just before sunset. And so we'll just run uh, the sunset here. See things getting darker, darker, 
until we get to uh, 10 o'clock where we'll stop this. Okay, starting with the evening planets. Um, well, the only thing in the evening sky in terms of planets is Uranus and you will need a, uh, a steadily held pair of good binoculars or a small telescope to see it. It is right on the horizon. It may be lost in the uh, the haze that uh, accompanies the horizon. We also have the uh, dwarf planet Ceres uh, up in uh, Taurus. It's been traveling through Taurus all, all winter. And uh, also uh, the moon isn't too far uh, from Ceres uh, tonight. Now, if we uh, advance uh, the evening sky through the days, we see the uh, Uranus uh, gradually dropping down. Uh, here we are, April the 12th. This is, and again, this is all at 10 o'clock uh, local time. And uh, we're starting to, see, by the 17th, we're starting to see Mercury very low on the horizon, very tough to spot. Uh, but it is going to get a lot higher, and it's going to be at its best view um, of the year in the evening sky. Here on the uh, 29th, uh, this is when Mercury is at its greatest, uh, we call, eastern elongation. It's also very close to the Pleiades here. And I'll talk about Mercury a little bit later on. But uh, as, as we follow Mercury uh, into the end of the month, here we are on the 30th, uh, still very high on the horizon. And uh, because the next um, What's Up is going to be on May the 4th, May the 4th be with you, uh, we'll just go a little bit into May. And it, as you can see, the moon is uh, entering the scene on the 1st. On the second, you could use the moon uh, to spot Mercury in the uh, in the dusk sky, and by the fourth, uh, Mercury is still well placed, still near the Pleiades. And here's a close up. Now at 10:30 on the 30th, uh, Mercury is still about five degrees above the horizon, which doesn't sound like a lot. But uh, it actually is. Um, if you have a, uh, a clear horizon uh, to the uh, northwest. Looking at the morning sky, and um, as has been in previous months, the ecliptic is still at a fairly low angle. So I've set the time for uh, 6 a.m. on uh, the 7th, which, tomorrow. And uh, at that time, uh, Saturn and Venus are already above the horizon, still fairly low from our latitude, but uh, if you have a clear uh, view to the uh, east-southeast um, and clear skies, uh, you should be able to at least make out Venus. Um, uh, I get up early in the morning sometimes and have a look out, and uh, there is Venus. I, I haven't seen Saturn recently. Uh, it's just the uh, sky is brightening too much and uh, just can't make it out. But if as we advance through the month uh, we see that uh, it is joined by uh, Jupiter and Neptune and also Mars is in between uh, Venus and Saturn. I, I should have pointed that out. Uh, so getting near the end of the month, you have this uh, parade of planets uh, in the uh, east-southeast sky. So let's just zoom in a little bit here. Uh, Neptune is also there, which you need uh, a small telescope or good steadily held binoculars. Again, they're still really low on the horizon, but uh, with a clear sky and a clear horizon, uh, you should be able to spot them, especially Venus and Jupiter, because they are quite bright. Now, moving to the end of the month here, you have the moon coming and visiting all the planets. On the 24th, it's near Saturn. On the 25th, it's near Mars. 
Uh, 26 is near well, Venus. And on the 27th, a very thin crescent near Jupiter. Now on the 30th, not only is uh, Mercury uh, well placed and near the Pleiades, Venus and Jupiter are very close to one another. Let's just zoom in here. And here they are, and uh, if we uh, measure them, they are about half a degree apart, uh, which is very, very close, uh, about the diameter of the full moon. So that's, that's a very close, um, it's a very close uh, conjunction. Um, in a low field uh, view in a telescope, uh, they should be in the same uh, field of view, similar to what uh, Jupiter and Saturn were um, around Christmas uh, in 2020. Now, unfortunately, on the 30th, uh, the sun comes up at 6 o'clock, so uh, let's make it 5.30 here. Um, so, uh, Venus is the brightest planet. Jupiter is the second brightest planet visible from Earth. So, uh, um, get up a little earlier. Find a uh, clear uh, horizon. Um, I plan to... Uh, well, I hope for clear skies, and I plan to go over by the uh, riverbank where I have a clear view of the eastern horizon and uh, see if I can spot these uh, two planets. Now, we do have a meteor shower uh, in April, and it is the Lyrids, which are um, active between the 15th and 29th, and they peak on the 22nd. So this is the uh, sky on the 22nd at 1130. Uh, it's well and truly dark. Like all meteor showers, get away from the city, find a nice dark spot. Um, and the, uh, even though the radiant is in the uh, northeast sky, the meteors uh, will go all over the place. They'll, they'll go here, there, everywhere. Uh, Lyra is fairly easy to spot. Uh, it contains a very bright star, Vega, one of the brightest stars in the sky. And uh, the radiant point is right here, so just a, a line, Vega. Um, so if we follow the um, course of uh, Lyra uh, through the night, you know, it gets higher and higher as the night uh, goes on. Let's just move it here. Here we are at 152. It's getting quite high. Uh, the best time to see it uh, would be uh, after 11 o'clock. Uh, before uh, it's just too low to the horizon. And here I've stopped it at uh, 440. The moon really isn't a factor. Uh, it's coming up uh, around 4-ish uh, or so, but it's uh, fairly low on the horizon. So the moon really won't interfere uh, unless you stay up really late. But even at, at uh, by 440, the sky is starting to lighten a bit. Uh, but... Uh, uh, the radiant now is is well placed, uh, very high overhead, and uh, if you're uh, in the mood, you can also uh, see the uh, summer triangle here. There we go. Uh, with Deneb, Vega, the radiant from the Lyrids, and then Altair down there, the summer triangle. Uh, looking into the uh, sun sky in terms of. Uh, uh, deep sky objects. Uh, we're saying farewell to the uh, winter constellations uh, in April and as we advance day to day uh, we see uh, the most prominent one, uh, Orion, sinking slowly into the west and by the uh, 30th at uh, 10.30 uh, his belt 
and uh, his legs and all that are below the horizon. Uh, Taurus, um, most of Taurus is below the horizon. Its horns are still sticking up. And even uh, Gemini is uh, heading uh, into the sunset now. If we go look in the east at the uh, end of the month, uh, Virgo is rising uh, nicely, as is uh, Leo and Cancer. I don't know if you noticed, but the ecliptic is starting to uh, uh, get a little bit lower. Uh, and also uh, we've got uh, Libra the Scales uh, about to come up at uh, the end of the month at 10.30. In the uh, north, uh, at 10.30, uh, we can see uh, a bit of Cygnus and uh, Lyra, or, uh, the uh, radiant for the Lyrids are, um, is located right, right about there. Uh, we also have uh, constellation Hercules with its uh, keystone figure. Uh, Butes with its very bright star Arcturus is now well above the horizon. Uh, we kind of lost Butes for a little bit during the winter uh, at this time of night. And if we look straight up, uh, we see uh, Ursa Major or the Big Dipper, uh, almost directly overhead, with its bowl turned toward the earth. And as the legends go, that is why it rains so much in April, because all the water is flowing uh, back to earth out of the Dipper. We can uh, use the uh, Big Dipper to find all sorts of different stars. We follow the arc of the handle and arc down to Arcturus. And then from Arcturus we spike down to Spica, the bright, brightest star in Virgo. And <clears throat> if we follow the uh, top of the dipper in a line, it points at uh, Capella, another very bright star. Speaking of Capella, uh, right now it's it's fairly high up in the sky, but uh, through the summer it's going to drop and move along the northern horizon. And it uh, features prominently in... Uh, uh, I lost it. Here we go. There we go. There's Capella. Uh, it features prominently in uh, pictures of uh, Noctilus and Cods, which we'll start to talk about next month because we're going to be entering the time of... Uh, perpetual twilight in, in May, and then all the way through June, and pretty much all the way through July also. And as I mentioned last month, there is a uh, ton of galaxies to see in the spring sky. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, the Leo's, Leo's triplet, but there's also M105, M M96, but in uh, Virgo, uh, the Virgo supercluster Let's just go back here. In the uh, bowl of Virgo, there is a whole bunch of galaxies there, both messy objects and NGC objects. Uh, the, these are telescopic objects uh, for sure, and you do need a dark sky. So if you're out in a dark site uh, looking at the Lyrids on uh, the 22nd uh, during the peak, uh, have a little time, if you wish, um, to uh, track down some galaxies if uh, you happen to bring a telescope with you. Of course, you don't need a telescope to see meteors. In fact, you won't see any meteors if you try and look at them through a telescope. And uh, while you're at it, there's also uh, some nice globular clusters, uh, which I'll talk about a little more uh, in uh, future episodes. Because, But right now, uh, the great... Uh, globular cluster in Hercules M13 uh, it is above the horizon it's uh, you know, it's better if it's a little bit higher up but it's uh, if you look at the uh, keystone of Hercules here and uh, look between the uh, these two stars here on the uh, in this view on the right hand side 
uh, you will come across uh, the great uh, Hercules uh, globular cluster, which is the brightest globular cluster you can see from uh, the northern hemisphere. There's, there's also another globular in Hercules M92. Uh, it's smaller, but it's uh, it's it's bright and it's a nice nice uh, target. And one more glob to look at is. Uh, Oh, up in uh, around Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, there's a a lot of galaxies to see too. If you have a telescope, uh, you have M81 and M82 here. Uh, the Whirlpool, which is uh, M51, which is um, kind of small, kind of faint, tough target, but you know uh, it is a a nice subject, nice topic. But if you follow the arc of uh, the handle to Arcturus, if you just veer off the road a little bit, you'll come to uh, a very nice globular cluster M3 right here, uh, situated between uh, Ursa Major and, uh, and Butes, just a bit off the beaten path. And before I go, uh, the uh, Beehive Cluster, which I've uh, talked about before, in uh, Cancer is almost directly overhead at uh, 1030 and it's a beautiful sight in binoculars uh, you can see it from very dark skies as a kind of a smudge in the sky looks great in binoculars a telescope uh, because it, the beehive is actually quite large and when I say large I mean it's bigger than a, than a full moon so it's not going to fit in the eyepiece of uh, a lot of telescopes, but uh, so binocular view is is best. But you know, if you look at it through a telescope, you can just kind of explore around the cluster. And uh, before we go, because I was talking about Capella earlier in uh, constellation Aguirre, the charioteer, uh, and there's Capella there. There's three open clusters M36 or M37 M38 and uh, they're a nice collection of stars there's M38 there's M36 and M37 right right there so they're a, they're a nice open cluster like the beehive so I think that is oh, I've got my sky all mixed up here okay um, so I guess that's it uh, in terms of the planetarium uh, program for this month. And uh, I will talk about uh, the meteor shower uh, just a little bit later on. Okay. All right. Uh, before I go any further, is there any questions? Or Alistair, do you have anything to chime in about? Uh, you covered it real well, Jeff. Uh, oh. Nothing more to add. Oh, okay. All right. Well, if there's no questions, we'll go on to the uh, moon. What do you see when you look at the moon? When it's full and round, do you see a balloon? Does it look like a cookie with a bite taken out? What do you see when you look at the moon? All right, uh, the moon was new on April the 1st, uh, marked the start of Ramadan uh, for those in the Islamic faith. It's first quarter on April the 9th, which is Saturday. It's full on the uh, 16th, and the full moon is in April is uh, known as the pink moon. And uh, it also has a variety of other names, uh, the sprouting grass moon, uh, the fish moon, I don't know about that, uh, the hair moon, maybe because the uh, hairs, and we have a lot of, in my neighborhood in, in the wintertime, I see the tracks all over my front lawn every morning. Uh, maybe they're, that's, it, it's a time where they turn from white back to brown. Oh, I uh, hit the button too soon. Uh, egg moon and uh, the Paschal moon uh, because it's associated with Easter. 
Um, and uh, Easter this year uh, is on the 17th. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Easter Sunday is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So uh, that first full moon was on the 16th and Easter is on uh, the 17th. Uh, third quarter is on the 23rd and we swing around again and the moon is new again on uh, April the 30th. Now I know that when there's two full moon, two full moons in a month, they call that a blue moon. I don't know what they call two new moons in a month. Uh, <laughs> whatever. So uh, for a feature of the moon, I try and pick something that is in uh, either the uh, RESC's uh, observe, one of the, the two RESC observe the moon certificate programs. There's one for binoculars and one for telescope. And uh, this one, because it's so large, and relatively famous actually, uh, is from the binocular uh, uh, program. And what I picked was something which surprises me that I've never actually talked about before, but talking about uh, the Sea of Tranquility or Mare Tranquilius. Um, and there it is there. Uh, it's approximately 873 kilometers in diameter and uh, was thought to be formed by a very large uh, impact about 3.9 billion years ago. Uh, then the crater was uh, flooded with uh, basalt, making it appear dark, making it smooth and relatively flat. Uh, there's only, it's only about 500 meters difference in elevation throughout the whole uh, sea or America area uh, between the highest and lowest points. And uh, that's excluding craters and rims and such. Uh, the uh, Sea of Tranquility, oh, I should just back this up once, one more here, because I uh, forgot something here. Um, the, uh, the Sea of Tranquility forms the uh, head of the rabbit, the lesser, fa le uh, not as famous as the man in the moon, but there is a rabbit in the moon and this is the head of the rabbit and there are its ears and then its body kind of goes back, uh, back there. So, um, and its irregular shape is uh, formed because there's uh, several other impact basins around them. Uh, Notably, uh, oh, there, there's my sign here. Uh, the Sea of Serenity, the Sea of Fertility, and uh, the Sea of Nectar. Uh, and also, of course, it's probably most famous uh, to the most people because it is the first pl uh, the place where the first uh, manned landing on the moon occurred. And I put a little X there. There's a little arrow pointing at the X. And that of course was Apollo 11. And this is a, uh, a close up view. The, the region's fairly flat. Uh, as I said before, there are three craters here in a line near the Apollo 11 landing site, which is right here, uh, named Aldrin, Collins and Armstrong. Uh, there is a large crater near the landing site called uh, Masculine, and it was uh, a landmark uh, that the uh, crew used uh, during the descent burn uh, uh, as a navigation point. And uh, Armstrong noted when they passed over this crater that they were they passed over it a few seconds before they were actually supposed to, and. Um, if you ever listen to the transmission uh, or read the transcript, he says, looks like we're going to be a little long. And they were, they overshot their intended landing site by a couple miles. Uh, Apollo 11 wasn't the first craft uh, to land in uh, the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, Ranger 8, uh, which was an impactor, but was returning um, uh, fairly high resolution pictures uh, up until the very end when it smacked into the surface, uh, landed in the Sea of Tranquility in 1964. And in 1967, Surveyor 5 soft landed uh, in the Sea of 
tranquility. Constellation I picked this month is a kind of a faint one, but it's it's a big one. Uh, and it is Draco. And it's right about here. And there we go. There's the astronomical view of Draco the dragon. And there is the dragon. It's one of the largest constellations in the sky. And Draco means dragon in Latin. And it's located in the uh, northern sky. It's circumpolar, which means it never sets when viewed from our latitude. In uh, Greek mythology, it represents, uh, and the Greek mythology isn't the only one, but it's probably the one. Well, I, I went through a number of stories and I, I like this story the best. So uh, in Greek mythology, it uh, represents uh, represents light Ladon, the dragon which guarded the golden apples in the garden of um, his parodies. Uh, the golden apple tree was a wedding present to Hera when she married Zeus, uh, king of the gods, and she planted the tree in her garden on Mount Atlas and tasked Atlas's daughter, um, his parodies, with guarding. Uh, uh, the garden and the tree specifically. And she placed this dragon around the tree uh, just in case uh, his parodies uh, was tempted to pick some of the apples from it. As part of his 12 labors, Hercules was asked to steal uh, some golden apples from the tree. Uh, and he defeated uh, the dragon with poisoned arrows and took the apples. Uh, Hera was very sad at the dragon's passing and placed its image in the sky uh, among the other constellations. The actual figure of uh, the dragon, there's 14 stars. Uh, three of them, as I said, it was a very, it's a fairly, fairly faint constellation. If you want to see the whole thing, you really got to go into a dark sky. You're not going to see uh, much in the city. Uh, there's three stars that are brighter than magnitude three and the rest are uh, magnitude three to four. Uh, in the whole boundary of the constellation, because constellations do have boundaries that uh, go beyond the figure, uh, there are um, uh, 76 other stars, uh, all of them quite faint. Uh, 19 stars are known to have planets. And uh, it does have a meteor shower associated with it in October, the uh, Dracoid uh, meteor shower. Uh, has a radiant uh, near the constellation. Uh, there's a couple deep sky objects in Draco also. Uh, one is uh, M102, the spindle galaxy. And it's right there. And there's a, uh, a nice picture of it. It's a uh, it's an edge on galaxy. It's about 50 million light years away. Uh, magnitude 10.7, so it is a telescopic object. Uh, you'll never see it with uh, your own eye. Um, and like I say, it's got a very prominent dust cloud uh, to it. And this is a, an amateur uh, picture of uh, the spindle galaxy. You can see it right there. Uh, nestled amongst uh, a number of other stars. Another deep sky object is uh, right here, and it is NGC 6543, also known as the Cat's Eye Nebula. And there it is there. And this is a uh, professional, this is a Hubble picture actually of this thing. And it's what's known as a planetary nebula. And a planetary nebula is the remains of a sun-like star at the end of its life. Four or five billion years from now, uh, our sun uh, or what's left of it could look like that. As, a, as the star uh, ages and, and burns up all its hydrogen in its core, uh, the core, uh, the sun, Sun, the star starts to collapse and uh, the pressure causes the um, uh, he helium in the core because hydrogen is fused into helium in the core of a sun. That's what gives it its power. Uh, the helium starts to burn and is fused into uh, carbon and oxygen and such. Uh, 
but the pressure uh, blows out outer layers of the sky of the star, and this is what this cloud of gas and dust is: is uh, the outer layers of the star puffed out uh, into space, and that is the fate of our own sun. Uh, you know, five, four or five billion years from now. It was discovered by William Herschel in uh, 1786. It's about 3,300 light years from here, and it's magnitude 8.1, again, a telescopic object. And this is an amateur photograph of it. Um, as I pointed out many times, uh, photographs see wavelengths of light that our eyes don't see. So if you looked at it through a telescope, it would more likely look just kind of gray. And uh, so that is uh, the Cat's Eye Nebula, that's Draco. And if you're a fan of Harry Potter and uh, Harry's nemesis, Draco Malfoy, that's where he got his name from, from this constellation. There's a lot of astronomical names in the Harry Potter uh, series. So other highlights this month, Mercury uh, is at its greatest Eastern elongation on the 29th. That's when it is furthest from the sun. And because our ecliptic is riding so high, uh, it gives us the best view of Mercury this year. And uh, there is the Lyrid meteor shower, which peaks on the 22nd. And there is a daytime lunar X on the 8th on, uh, on Friday. Uh, as I pointed out, I think uh, last month, um, all the lunar X's, which happen about every couple months uh, from now on, are all in the daytime uh, from our location throughout this year. So uh, this is a picture I took of uh, Mercury uh, last year. Uh, we had the moon here. Um, I think I took that in May. Um, and if you can't see it, it's right here. Let's, there's a little arrow. And there, we highlighted it. There's Mercury right there. I had the moon to uh, assist. But um, you can see how high it is in the sky. Mercury is usually, you know, you find uh, Mercury like way down here, you know, in line with the trees. But uh, this time around this year, um, <clears throat> later in the month, uh, Mercury is going to be quite high and, and easy to spot in the uh, dust sky. You might want to get out with a pair of binoculars first just to see it in the uh, in the uh, in the dusk. Uh, but once you can spot it with binoculars, you put your binoculars on, you should be able to see it with your own eye. And this is just another uh, close-up picture of uh, Mercury there. And as I mentioned, we have the Lyrids. It, it's not a strong meteor shower. It's about 10 to 15 an hour. Uh, the parent comet is Comet C1861-G1 uh, Thatcher. Uh, get away from the city, get away from lights, uh, take a chair with you. A gravity chair works great. Take a thermos of hot coffee or hot chocolate and dress warm uh, because it does get chilly at night. And uh, as I said, this is this picture or this sky set up is April 22nd at 1230 in the morning. So uh, yeah, that's that's another thing. When I say April 22nd, I'm talking about the morning of April 22nd. Don't go out on the night and then it's the 23rd. You miss the peak. So and as I said, we have the lunar X, there it is there. <clears throat> it's a transient feature on the moon. It's, uh, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, uh, sunlight shining on uh, some crater tops and they form an X. It only lasts about four hours. And uh, there's also a, what we call the lunar V a little further up. And as I said, it's happening in the daytime sky uh, this time around. So. <clears throat> this is about this is where the moon's going to be uh, at about two thirty in the afternoon. So it's well up in the sky on uh, on the eighth. And just excuse me for a second. Sorry about that. <clears throat> and oh, we have some chats. I'll I'll look at them at the end if that's all right. <clears throat> 
So we'll go into the uh, space history uh, part of this. And I pick an item uh, that occurred uh, in the past uh, in relationship to space and uh, its anniversary year is divisible by five. So uh, this year, it's a year that ends in either a two or a seven. And I really struggled uh, with this one because there was actually three or four events that happened uh, this month and uh, I narrowed it down to two and I couldn't decide which one. So I'm gonna do both. Um, oops. Okay. Soyuz 1. Um, now this is a Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, it's been uh, in service with the Soviet Union slash Russia for over 50 years. And it is a uh, fairly reliable spacecraft. It's well known. It's uh, used to ferry uh, astronauts and cosmonauts up to the International Space Station. This is the uh, latest variant of it, the Soyuz MS. Uh, but the very first Soyuz, Soyuz 1, which flew in 1967, didn't, well, it, it had the same basic shape, but it, uh, it looked like this. Um, it had gull wing solar panels, had these big antennas sticking out on the front. Um, it had the, all the features of, of the current Soyuz, which is the orbital module, this egg-shaped thing at the front, the descent module, this bell-shaped thing where the uh, astronauts slash cosmonauts would uh, ride in uh, during launch and re-entry, and then the, uh, uh, the service uh, module at the back, which contained uh, uh, the power generating solar panels and its fuel, uh, batteries, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, you know, the current Soyuz, in, uh, in fact, uh, even into the early uh, or late mid seventies, um, all had a, a docking tunnel where they, they would dock with a space station or another uh, and uh, open a hatch and crawl through it. The early Soyuz didn't have this. It had this big uh, uh, mechanism on the front with the, with the docking probe, but, uh, there was no tunnel. If you wanted to transfer from the Soyuz to whatever you happen to dock with, you had to go uh, make an EVA out of the orbital module and uh, and dock or and uh, spacewalk to the uh, whatever you happen to dock with. So uh, the Soyuz was originally designed um, as Russia's universal um, spacecraft uh, and a variant of it. Uh, if you've ever seen a picture of what they plan to send to the moon as the equivalent of the American command service module, it looks like a Soyuz on steroids. Uh, but anyway, so the pilot of the very first Soyuz craft was this guy, uh, Vladimir uh, Komarov. And uh, he was launched into space on April 23rd, 1967. Now, the, uh, the Soviet Union uh, was really in a rush to beat the Americans to the moon. And uh, they had started late. Uh, I won't go into the whole Soviet lunar program. Uh, that'll just take too, too much time. But they did test unmanned uh, variants of the Soyuz uh, three times. And all three of them failed in one way or another. Usually they had problems with their guidance system. Uh, two were lost completely. Um, the third one, uh, they did recover, but uh, it uh, came in at such an angle that it burned a 12 inch hole through the heat shield. And if there had been a cosmonaut on board, he would have been killed. Uh, but the politicians wanted a flight uh, uh, of this thing to try and beat the US because the US of course was recovering from the Apollo one fire, which happened in January of 1967. Engineers, noted that there were over 200 discrepancies with the craft. They did not want to fly it. But nevertheless, on April 23rd, 1967, um, Vladimir Komarov uh, became the first pilot of Soyuz 1. 
Uh, the plan was uh, Soyuz 1 would go into orbit, and then the next day they would launch Soyuz 2, and they would uh, rendezvous and dock in orbit. Uh, that was the original flight plan. And then, if I don't know if you can see this, there's some guys on the outside. They would transfer crew from one Soyuz uh, to the other, then they would separate and then uh, return to Earth. Uh, it was very ambitious because the Russians had never... Uh, accomplished a manned rendezvous or docking in space, something that the U.S. had done many times with the Gemini program. Now, if any one of you have watched Alistair's um, program, um, when I sit in, I don't have this green screen behind me, and you might have seen a, a bunch of rockets on a shelf behind me, uh, because I do build models of these things. And this is my model of an earlier Soyuz uh, so you can see all the features, you know, the, the big docking port, the gull wing solar panels, this big rendezvous antenna on a, on a, on a truss work here. So as soon as the uh, Soyuz, uh, I, I'm, I'm using this to, as an explanation here. So as soon as uh, Soyuz got into orbit, they ran into problems. Uh, the big problem was, and uh, don't worry, I didn't wreck my model. I just did this optically. One of the solar panels didn't deploy, and uh, or partially deployed, and uh, not so. They were uh, the craft lacked power. It was also blocking some of the sensors used uh, for the guidance system. Uh, so uh, the Soyuz was virtually uncontrollable. Uh, Komarov struggled with this thing uh, to try and uh, keep the uh, uh, craft uh, steady. Uh, there were systems failing. Uh, the Soyuz 2 mission was canceled and Soyuz 1 would attempt to land uh, on the 18th orbit the next day when it would be coming over um, the Soviet Union and the designated recovery area. As the uh, automated systems had failed, Komarov was forced uh, uh, to, uh, once the parts had all separated, uh, to spin the capsule in order for it to remain stable during reentry. Uh, because the jets um, uh, used to keep it stable through uh, entry uh, just wouldn't work because the guidance system was was uh, malfunctioning. And uh, I've heard recordings; they're all in Russian. I just got to trust the uh, uh, the subtitles that I see uh, of him cursing uh, uh, the bosses that decided to uh, launch him in this defective craft all the way down uh, to to Earth. Um, parachutes malfunctioned, uh, a drogue chute popped up, popped out to stabilize the craft. So, I mean, he, Komarov, uh, in a Herculean effort, managed to get the craft uh, through uh, through the worst part of reentry. Uh, the drogue chute popped out. Uh, when the main chute was supposed to pop out, it didn't. Um, it was defective. Uh, the drogue chute was supposed to release, but it didn't. Uh, Komarov manually released the reserve chute. It tangled with the drogue chute and uh, the craft hit the ground at about 160 kilometers an hour, uh, then exploded uh, because its landing rockets, which fired just before touchdown, ignited. So this is what was left of the Soyuz 1 descent module um, after it hit the ground and burnt. Um, and the next picture is very disturbing, but uh, that's what's left of Komarov after they got him out. He was the first person to die during a space flight. Um, of course, he was given a hero's uh, funeral and uh, his ashes are interned uh, in, the, in the Kremlin wall. Uh, and like I said, he was the first person to die in a space flight. Uh, so far, 18 people have died during space flight, 14 Amer uh, on American craft and uh, four Soviet slash Russian have uh, died. So the other story is a little happier. Apollo 16, uh, which was the penultimate lunar mission, was the uh, second of what was called the J uh, Apollo missions, the J missions, which were heavily uh, focused on science and exploration. They also carried uh, the lunar rover and the command service module was outfitted with uh, a whole suite of instruments for studying the moon from orbit. Uh, there were three crew members, uh, uh, Ken Mattingly, 
commander was John Young and uh, Charlie Duke. Uh, command module pilot was Mattingly. He was uh, originally supposed to fly on Apollo 13, but was removed and replaced with Jack Swagger uh, because he had been exposed uh, to the measles. Uh, John Young uh, was uh, a veteran astronaut. He flew on two Gemini missions. He flew on Apollo 10. So he was the second person uh, to, or pardon me, yeah, the second person to journey to the moon twice. Charlie Duke was a, um, a rookie astronaut. Um, you hear a lot of Charlie Duke because he was a Capcom uh, during the Apollo 11 landing. So if you listen to a recording of the landing, he's the guy who was talking to them. Uh, when they were uh, landing. They did extensive training in geology. Um, they went to all sites all over North America. They even went to Sudbury, Ontario to study those formations. This is a picture of them in Sudbury. They also uh, went to the Grand Canyon and deserts in uh, New Mexico and, uh, and such. So um, on April the 16th, uh, they lifted off uh aboard the saturn V and headed out toward the moon and they arrived in lunar orbit on the 19th of april and they entered a 100 kilometer uh, circular orbit uh, later on to save uh, fuel for the landing the uh, command service module and docked to the lunar module took them down to uh a paraloon of 19.8 kilometers above the landing site, uh, which earlier missions, uh, they the LEM would burn for 30 seconds to get down there. Uh, and then they would do one more orbit and then they would land. So by having the command module, which had lots more fuel than it ever would require for a mission, uh, carry them down there, it gave the uh, lunar module another 30 seconds of fuel uh, that you could use for landing. So Orion uh, separated and uh, from, uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention the, uh, the code names for the lunar module was Orion and the code name for the command service module was Casper. And so there's Casper there and you can kind of see there part of the uh, instrument suite uh, there, uh, the scientific instrument and mapping bay, they called it the SIM bay. Uh, the first real big problem in the mission uh, popped up uh, right after they separated. Um, the flight plan called uh, for uh, the command module to fire its engine again and go back up to a 100 kilometer circular orbit. Um, the motor on the back of the command module, you can't see it in this picture, um, has uh, gimbal motors uh, to help steer it. There's a primary gimbal motors and then there's backup gimbal motors. Uh, in case the primaries fail. Uh, there was nothing wrong with the primary gimbal motors, but the backup gimbal motors were giving indication that they weren't working properly. And if that, uh, if they could not resolve that, it would, they would have to, the LEM would have to dock, redock with the CSM and then they would just come home. Uh, but uh, after a few uh, tense hours, they resolved the problem and Orion landed in the Descartes Highland region. It was the first mission to land in the Lunar Highlands. So this is where they landed right here. It shows all the landing sites. Um, as you can see, there's Apollo 11, which we talked about a little earlier in uh, Sea of Tranquility. Anyway, uh, Apollo 16 landed in the Descartes Highlands. Uh, now that region that was chosen because uh, it was felt the area was volcanic in origin and not formed by result of impacts. So after a sleep, uh, period, uh, uh, Young and uh, Duke uh, descended to the lunar surface, unpacked the lunar rover, which was which is stowed right in here, set it up, uh, got it ready to go, and uh, then they went on uh, to explore the uh, moon in uh, uh, three EVAs over a period of three days. This is probably the most famous picture that came out of that uh, mission was a jumping salute by John Young. Uh, they set up the first and so far only uh, telescope on the moon. Uh, this is an ultraviolet uh, uh, telescope 
uh, which they set up in the shadow of the lunar module, uh, they felt, uh, because ultraviolet light is filtered by our own atmosphere, they thought the moon would be a great place to put up a scope and uh, take some pictures in the ultraviolet range of light. And uh, these are uh, some of the pictures it took. Uh, this is a star field. I, I don't know which star field this is. And this is Earth in ultraviolet light. Now, speaking of the star field, I, I know the uh, lunar uh, landing hoax people say, how come you don't see stars in the pictures? Well, because the exposure isn't set to see stars. But if you have the exposure set to see stars, you see lots of stars. But uh, there were other problems uh, on, uh, on the moon. Um, they were going to do a, a heat flow experiment, which had involved drilling uh, some 10 foot deep holes and, and putting uh, heat flow sensors down in the bottom of them and uh, uh, getting uh, uh, readings uh, from below the surface. Now they carried that same experiment on Apollo 15, but the drill uh, couldn't power through the, uh, the lunar soil. So they abandoned it and uh, on uh, Apollo 16, they also had a problem because uh, when they were setting up the uh, experiment package, uh, John Young uh, tripped over uh, the cable to the heat flow experiment and pulled it out of the uh, main um, um, central station. And uh, well, he basically broke the wires and uh, so there was no data returned. They did get it right on the Apollo 17. Um, by the end of the first EVA, Duke and Young uh, were thinking that the idea of volcanic activity at the site was wrong uh, because they were finding nothing uh, to show that. Uh, there was no igneous rocks at all. It was all basalt and, and such. Uh, one of the highlights of Apollo uh, 16 EVA was came on the third EVA and, and uh, involved something that's been nicknamed House Rock, which is this thing back here. Now, because there is no air on the moon, it's really hard to tell distance. Um, Charlie Duke thought this rock was not, well, was A, not very big and B, not very far away from where they were parked. Um, and they were parked to uh, at a place called North Ray Crater. So this is a lunar uh, reconnaissance orbiter mission uh, picture. So this is where they were parked. And uh, I don't know if it shows up here, but you can see their footprints walking over to House Rock. And there's a scale of 100 meters. So this thing was further than a football field away, but you know, Duke thought it was about here. And uh, in the transcripts or the recordings, when they're talking about this rock, uh, Duke says, oh, it's not very far. Uh, it, it's just beyond. Uh, where you're, you're standing, John, because John Young was standing a little further away. And uh, they were taking samples. They said, well, let's go about halfway there. So they stopped about here and they figured they were halfway to this rock, but they just kept walking and walking and walking and getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, till they got to this, this rock. And I've got a video further on uh, where, I'll, where I'll show that. So they're, they're where they were, Station 11, uh, and North Ray Crater is just on the edge of this photo. And there's the house rock. Uh, the rocks they brought back um, to Earth confirmed that the landing site wasn't volcanic in nature at all. Uh, there was no evidence that showed any, any sign of, of volcanism. Uh, there was a nearby mountain, which they drove a little ways up, uh, called Stone Mountain, which they thought was, well, the scientists thought it was volcanic, but it wasn't. Um, and the, like I said at the beginning, that's one of the reasons Descartes was selected uh, because it looked, it was visually different from the other Apollo sites. Uh, and they thought it was volcanic, but it, it, it wasn't. It, and the rocks uh, resembled more what uh, they found at Apollo 14's landing sites. So, uh, so the geologists realized that they'd been over reliant on uh, analogies from Earth, but the moon does not share much of Earth's geologic history. And they concluded there's few, if any, volcanic mountains on the moon. Uh, later on, uh, John Young commanded uh, two space shuttle missions. He actually flew on the very first space shuttle flight 
Uh, Ken Mattingly also flew on two shuttle flights, commanded two shuttle flights. Uh, Young served as chief astronaut from 1974 to 1987. He died in 2018. Uh, Charlie Duke retired from NASA in uh, the mid 70s. Uh, Mattingly and Duke are uh, both 86 and they're both still alive. So I put together a little movie here of uh, some of the highlights. Uh, oh, one more thing. Um, the things you left behind. Um, this is a nice picture because it's such a nice sediment. Uh, Charlie Duke left a picture of his family uh, on the moon. And it's still there, but I'm sure it's bleached completely white by now in the sun. And they also left a mortar. <laughs> uh, and what this mortar was for is for seismic experiments. And they fired this thing off uh, a few days after they left and uh, recorded the seismic readings uh, to get a better idea of the moon's interior. And this is the landing site from uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. You can see the descent stage uh, left behind here. <coughs> the uh, all set package, the instrument package they left is over here. The rover is back here. You can see all sorts of tracks and such. And it doesn't show up very well here, but there's a little black smudge there. And that's the shadow of the flag. It's still up there and it's probably bleached white too. Uh, because it was just a, it wasn't a special space flag. It was just a regular nylon flag that they, uh, I understand they bought them at Sears and uh, hooked them up with uh, a support. So it would stand upright in the, uh, in the uh, moon's uh, vacuum. So I put together a little movie. <clears throat> and uh, so what it's going to show is the landing on April 20th, even though it says April 21st. I must must have been uh, reading a uh, UT time when I uh, put this together. Uh, a pan uh, from the uh, rover camera showing the UV camera on the moon. Uh, John Young saluting the flag. Uh, Charlie Duke drilling the uh, heat flow holes uh, for the heat flow experiment. And then John Young pulling the cable out of the heat flow experiment. Uh, if you watch his foot, you can see that the cable is wrapped around his foot, but in the heavy spacesuit, he just didn't realize it was there. And because um, the, cam the TV camera on the lunar rover uh, is on the rover, no one had actually seen, other than the astronauts, what the rover looked like when it moved on the, on the moon. So uh, Charlie Duke, Duke took a movie of the rover uh, to show the people back at home and the engineers just what the rover was doing when it was moving. And then I have a, a bit on the house rock, call it objects are further than they appear. Uh, at the end of the third EVA, how filthy the spacesuits got and uh, the lunar liftoff from the window uh, with a movie camera and the LRV uh, lunar rover camera. And then a slow motion of the liftoff from the rover camera showing the back of the ascent stage cover coming loose because uh, it was all about, you know, the limb was all about keeping it as light as possible. So it wasn't heavy covers over, over the um, back of the rover or back of the uh, ascent stage, which is where most of the electronics for it were stored. Uh, it was just basically like sheets of aluminum foil. And uh, the blast from the ascent stage engine uh, knocked uh, these covers loose. And you can see them flapping as the thing takes off. And then uh, a picture of the ascent stage in, uh, in orbit with the rear cover damage. So here we go here. Okay, down at three, 50 feet, down at four. Give me one quick up.
could set the flag up on a hill, Charlie, but there just ain't one. Hey, John, this is perfect with the limb and the rover and you and, and uh, Stone Mountain and the old flag. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Navy salute. Look at this. That's a pretty outstanding picture here, I tell you. Come on a little bit closer. Okay, here we go, a big one. Off the ground, on the floor. There we go. Ten. Hey, you got it ready? Here we go. Mark. Hey, that beauty is going right in. Outstanding. Okay, the uh, second one, the uh, thermal covers into the second red mark, and Tony, the uh, the probe is out of the ground up to B8, okay. right, between, right on the line between B7 and B8. Okay, Baker, 7 and 8. Roger, we saw that though. What a 
What a ride, what a ride. Okay, um, I have one last thing. Uh, starting with Apollo 11, every all the uh, astronauts had a press conference on the way back home. And um, when uh, Apollo 16 had a press conference, uh, the very first question uh, wasn't about the moon or the rover or anything else. It was about uh, some comments that uh, enraged the Florida citrus grow, citrus growers, uh, because uh, uh, Young and Duke were talking to about uh, talking to one another, and they did not realize they had a hot mic. And uh, Young was having a little problem with uh, with gas, so uh, here it is. Okay, and I sure think it's staying off. You guys did an outstanding job. I got the parts again. I got them again, Charlie. I mean, I haven't eaten this much citrus fruit in 20 years. And I'll tell you one thing. In another 12 fucking days, I ain't never eat any more. I put them up over the, right up in there. They ain't there? Oh, shit. Orion, right, Houston. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm down your way. have my hot mic. How oh, long we had that? always mention uh, heavens above uh, it's a great uh, resource online it's got star maps it's got satellite passes it's got information on comets uh, with finder charts it's got all sorts of interesting stuff uh, uh, you can look at uh, the next what's up is going to be on uh, wednesday may the 4th maybe i'll wear my darth vader math mask for that but anyway uh <laughs> Uh, our next uh, meeting of uh, RAC Edmonton Center is on uh, Monday, April the 11th. And Alistair does his introduction to stargazing every month. And his next session is on Wednesday, April the 27th. These are all at 7.30 uh, p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. And with that, I will say thank you. And is there any questions? Yeah, Jeff, uh, one of the ones in the chat uh, was um, at the end of April, when the planets are near the moon, what is the best viewing time? What direction do I look at in the sky? And I, okay. had, a, uh, I had a look at that and uh, um, it's, it's basically 4.30. Yeah, yeah, it's really early in the morning uh, because, you know, where we live, the sun comes up earlier and earlier uh, as we get closer to the solstice. So yeah, it's going to be like 4.35 in the morning and uh, find yourself a, a place where you can uh, look across into the uh, east-southeast because that's, that's where they're going to be. And they'll be really, really low. Uh, that's why I'm going to go to the riverbank and... Uh, uh, because it's uh, it's close to my house and uh, well relatively close, and uh, I have a clear view uh, to the east, so that, that's where you would want to go. Yeah, and and just as to to show how quickly uh, things change around here, uh, if you're to go out um, in a couple of mornings to have a look, um, it's at a quarter past five. It is the time to, to have a look. And so it's, yeah, 45 minute change from not even the start to end of month. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, like tomorrow the sun's coming up at uh, 6.45 and at the end of the month it's coming up at six. So, you know, we've lost an hour or gained an hour of daylight, lost an hour of night. Uh, 
So yeah, and because dust, because of where we are, the dust lasts so so much longer. Um, so yeah, you got to get up early, or uh, I don't know, watch infomercials all night. Watch the shopping channel. They never get off the air. <laughs> and um, regarding the Mercury apparition, uh, yep. as much as the uh, peak greatest elongation is towards the end of the month, uh, the time to start looking is essentially on the 14th and 15th uh, with binoculars. And then by the 18th, it'll be, oh yeah, there it is. And, and so you've actually got almost a 10 day block uh, of uh, it, it's uh, Mercury will look like a um, a plane, a distant plane coming into land. It, it's sort of that bright, N not a close one coming into land, but one that's you know it's like oh yeah that thing must be like uh, halfway to Jasper or something like that. And it, but it's on the way in, and it's just like nope, that's Mercury. Yeah, yeah, it's no Venus, that's for sure. But it, it is bright, uh, brightish, we'll say. Yeah, and, and, um, but especially start with uh, binoculars and, uh, and all of a sudden um, over two, three nights, it's like, oh, I got it now. Yeah, yeah that's what I do. I, I start looking for it, you know, uh, shortly after sunset with binoculars. And then once I spot it, then I can usually find it with my naked eye. So Yeah, and, and the, the, um, uh, the media tend to make a big deal of the greatest elongation. And as it turns out, from our latitude and for the evening uh, views of Mercury, greatest elongation is essentially, it's already that li little past prime and is already fading. It's, yes, it's high, but it's, it's fading. And so there, there's a kind of a trade-off to slightly lower and brighter, then it hits its peak and it's already fading. So uh, the days leading up, to that greatest elongation are actually far better than the days after because it's uh, quite often with these uh, the media thing it's just like you know oh if, you know here it is and you think oh i'll uh, i'll have a look at it in a day or two when it gets clear <laughs> and, and then it's already fading yeah because when it's coming uh when it hits greatest uh, well how do we put this uh, when it starts popping up above the horizon it's it's in a gibbous phase and uh and then eventually you'll go to a crescent phase. So yeah, it's getting closer to earth, but it's, you know, it's getting less, less light shining on it. So it fades. Okay, what else we got here? End of April, two new moons. A black moon, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Okay. I've, yeah, I've actually heard it called, and of course, when it's a super moon, you know, a super black moon, it's like, Ooh, that's scary. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Jeff, about oh. um, the the EVAs. When um, well, either it doesn't matter whether it's the the Soviet or the uh, American ones. When they pop the hatch, have they first sucked the air out of the in inside of the craft to save oh, oh, the yeah. air, or do yeah. they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. They the, if they ever opened the hatch when it was fully pressurized, the the thing might you know blow right off or bend the hinges, so they'd never get the damn oh, thing closed course. again. Yeah. No, no. They depressurize it before. Yeah, yeah. They always depressurize before an EVA. So you bet. And of course, now that you say that, it's like, uh, yeah, obviously, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's like if you went, uh, well, when I was a kid, I used to watch Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, you know, and uh, they would always be going in the airlock and, you know, filling it up with water because if they, well, A, you'd never get the hatch open if, you know, if it wasn't full of water, but if they managed to open the water and all this water comes flashing in and crushes whoever's in there. So, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, off on a tangent. <laughs> Is there any other question? Oh, we got another chat here. What's this? Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Is there anything else? I'm amazed how much oxygen they must have hauled along for those astronauts for that long a time. 
Well, it, it's they, they take it in the form of liquid oxygen uh, because you can get a lot more liquid oxygen in a tank than oh. air air. Uh, and it, it would just yeah, gradually, uh, it would gradually turn to a gas and they would release it. Yeah. But yeah, no, it, it's, it's always liquid oxygen that they take. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I was just uh, recently talking to one of my friends who's a respiratory therapist at the U of A hospital and we were talking about oxygen and apparently you can fit 700 times the amount of oxygen in the same volume if it's liquid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the um, the oxygen tanks in the uh, uh, on the Apollo spacecraft, there was two two of them. Well, they added a third one after the Apollo thirteen accident in a different part of the craft, uh, so that what happened on thirteen uh, wouldn't happen. You know where one tank exploded and it damaged the one sitting next to it. Um, they figure uh, if you put an ice cube inside this tank, because it was so well insulated, it would take months and months for this thing to melt, you know, because they had to keep the oxygen cold during the flight. And liquid oxygen, if, if, if they just left it alone, it would be years for uh, it to eventually boil off. So yeah. Was uh, yeah, they take you know, you know any oxygen they take on space flights, it's it's always liquid. Um, now they do make oxygen with these machines uh, aboard the space station. Uh, they burn some sort of a candle that releases oxygen. So I remember a friend of mine had a kind of a welding apparatus or acetylene torch type of thing. And it burnt this solid white thing. You had acetylene in one tank, and then this white stuff burning in the next, and uh, that released oxygen for the torch. So, so it's probably something similar. Cool. Okay. So, uh, what were they eating up there? <laughs> What's what this you... about the oranges? <laughs> Can you? Be... Oh, uh, oh yeah. Okay. Well, what they were doing, they were, um, they were making them drink this orange drink. It was basically fortified tang and they loaded it up with potassium because they were worried that the potassium would leach out of their system and give them all sorts of health problems during the flight. So they had to drink this stuff constantly and they would monitor, you know, what they were drinking and it just gave John Young the farts <laughs> and he just... <laughs> He said, no, I'm not going to eat another orange. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that's what it was. It was because they had to drink this orange drink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't have actual citrus fruit up there. They had this citrus drink they had to drink. Mm -hmm. yeah. They had an, uh, um, in, in Astronomy Magazine a, uh, a 50th anniversary of it. And yeah, the, when uh, his John Young's reply to the, uh, you know, What's a good Florida boy like you saying? And uh, at, at the at this press conference, and John Young said, "Well, you drink this stuff for you know, two weeks straight, and and then we'll talk." Uh, small spacesuit tight quarters. Yeah, <laughs> they may have threatened to throw him out the airlock. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Well, there were only two guys, so I, I don't know. It would have been an interesting fight. <laughs> All righty. Uh, good well, evening, everyone. Yeah, well, thanks for you guys uh, for joining us. Um, this is recorded, and I'm going to put, uh, put it on YouTube in a day or two uh, if you want to look at it again. And uh, so thanks, Alistair. Thank you, everyone who joined us. And uh, we'll see you again next month. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.